I didn't actually get the chance to talk to many of you, but I've heard that so far it's been a great conference. You've been a good audience, so I hope that you are going to enjoy this talk as well. And yeah, we're, t we're going to talk about from Angular to React and back again. So when you hear this kind of topic, you might be thinking it's going to be like a fight of the giants and, you know, uh, competition and different, uh, sorry, can't really get used to my, uh, different uh, features and performance uh, of each versus the other, but we were looking at a different angle and that's like uh, showing you guys that they're very similar and basically it's just use what you need. And so uh, before we start, this is like a, we're going to do a short introduction. And so my name is Simona Cotin. Uh, I work for Microsoft as a developer advocate. And I, I think many of you might know John Papa or Sarah Dresner. Can I get a show of hands? Oh yeah, that's great. <laughs> so I, the, the, we're in the same team, and uh, Asim, who's going to speak here tomorrow, uh, we're also in the same team, and so we're having lots of fun there, making the Node.js community happy on Azure. And uh, before that, I used to work on. Pro I mean, I have a background in working with Angular JS and Java. And Arthur. Yeah. So I'm a full stack JavaScript developer for a healthcare startup in London. Uh, and I, in my day to day, I use React and Node.js for backend. And you can find us on Twitter at Simon underscore Cotin or. Or Pack Away, written like that, which is a typo. Yeah, anyway. So then let's start with, uh, with Angular and AngularJS, right? The mission statement of Angular is one framework, mobile, and desktop. And uh, Angular, J Angular was released in September 2014. And uh, it's like three years ago, right? It has the three years anniversary. And it's been released under, under the MIT license. And it has a little over 400 contributors. But we all know, right, that this is not the true Angular, or maybe it is the true Angular, but it, it has a history, right? The first project, the first version of the project, which was um, created by uh, Mishko Hevery, who is basically known as Papa Mishko because he's the Angular creator. He started Angular as a hobby project back in 2009. And AngularJS has proved itself uh, in a pet project where he basically got to replace the Google feedback application, which was uh, 17,000 lines of code, uh, which was developed in six months. Uh, he reduced it to 1,000 lines of code, and he managed to re-implement it in three weeks. So I'm not sure if he's like a hero developer that instead of sleeping and eating, he just writes code, but definitely he managed to prove that AngularJS is a, a sustainable project. It's something that other people in Google should start working. And what AngularJS brought to the front-end world was basically MVC on the front-end, it also brought dependency injection on the front end, and it also had features like uh, two-way data binding, which made things very easy. And um, as AngularJS was growing in popularity, the Angular team has, has realized that uh, they actually need to th start thinking about the next generation of Angular because uh, the web ecosystem was evolving so much that somehow AngularJS uh, remained backwards in a way. And so they got inspired uh, by things like ES6 where they uh, learned about classes and modules and they're like, we, we gotta have that. We gotta have the synthetic sugar of ES6. And then also web components about like, reusability and uh, maybe the community initially wasn't very open to web components but then uh, it was actually a very good idea. React, da da, <laughs> surprise, they've proved that one way data binding is actually much more performant than two way data binding. So that's when they, uh, Angular got inspired. Um, AngularJS was one of the early adopters of promises because Igor Minari, he was really keen on promises, but then he realized that RxJS is super cool as well. It's uh, the low dash for events, right, for reactive programming, and it, the, it handles async very well. And so uh, Angular has adopted RxJS. Um, because AngularJS was used mostly in 
large projects and in very complex projects and with large teams, that meant that you need to find a way to maintain your code. And then, type, and then TypeScript kind of came in, into the game here because of the error checking and automatic refactoring and uh, ID support and so many, so much goodness. And finally, um, because of, it turns out that Angular is actually quite complex to get started with, and Ember already had uh, ways to kickstart or bootstrap a project, they got inspired from, from Ember CLI as well. And so another important aspect of Angular is performance. And uh, as many of you might know, performance is not a single number. It's not, you cannot just look at performance and you say, oh, this is easy to fix, this is easy to measure. You have to look at performance from different angles. And two of the angles that the Angular team has looked into at performance uh, are in terms of size and in terms of speed. And with lazy loading, you get to uh, improve size because um, you basically send just the modules that you need uh, to the browser initially, and that makes up for a very good or a very fast startup time. And then AOT, AOT brought, AOT stands for ahead of time compilate, yeah, ahead of time compilation. Uh, have you guys worked with AOT? Yeah? That's great, we have an Angular crowd here. I love it. Uh, so with AOT, you get faster re-rendering, you also get uh, fewer synchronous requests because basically your assets are bundled together so um, you request less templates and CSS files and then uh, you also have a smaller Angular framework because you no longer need to send the Angular compiler over the wire. Uh, you can detect template errors earlier and uh, you have better security because you're uh, compiling your uh, HTML to JavaScript and you have less opportunity for injections. And so this is not a very up-to-date um, slide in the sense that the performance metrics here, they're not, I think it's even better now, but basically the idea is that with AOT you get 60% uh, improvement in load time and 60% improvement in size. That's awesome, right? So another cool thing in, uh, in Angular is tree shaking and it works very well with AOT. So basically here um, you, uh, you get to analyze the code and the dependency tree and basically if uh, some modules are not used in your code then they're not going to be included in your final body. And in order to get uh, to profit from this goodness uh, you can uh, use the Angular CLI to build your project for production and you use the minus minus prod uh, flag, which is basically a meta flag that's going to enable AOT. It's going to set your, set your environment for production and do many other things. And so that's, that's Angular. So what about React? So React's uh, mission statement is it's a JavaScript library for building user interfaces. And the key takeaways from that, it's a library. It's not a framework. Uh, it started out in uh, 2012 uh, inside Facebook and it was uh, mainly used to rewrite the uh, news feed in, of Facebook and also Pete Hunt pushed for uh, a rewrite of Instagram's website using uh, the early versions of React and that's when it really took off. Uh, it's uh, open source, it's licensed, uh, it was open sourced in 2013. Uh, it's licensed under the BSD3 with the patent clause, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, the, they promote, like Angular, no surprise there, uh, component-based architecture. They uh, are strong advocates of uh, predictable application state, and most times you would use a state management uh, library for it, like Redux. Uh, they use ES6. And they also have their own kind of strong static typed uh, library, which is called Flow. But one of the most uh, known facts about React is that it has the virtual DOM. And basically, that's, it wasn't invented by Facebook, it wasn't uh, written by them, and the concepts are not, were not new at that time, but 
made that popular. So basically, the virtual DOM is a, a way of calculating uh, what changes need to be pushed into the real DOM. The virtual DOM is a, a JavaScript object that gets uh, uh, applied to the real DOM because uh, real DOM changes are expensive in terms of performance. Behind this, there are two uh, iterations of an algorithm, which is called the reconciliation algorithm. The first version in 2013 was based on a recursive uh, traversal of the DOM tree. Uh, and uh, uh, the second iteration has started in 2016 and hopefully is going to come out this year. I think there's a couple of release candidates ready. And it's called Fiber. And you can clearly see uh, in the slide to, to the right, uh, to, well, your left. Which is your left? Up. Can I see your left? <laughs> oh, yeah. There you cool. go. You know what that is. <laughs> so, yeah, on the left hand side, you will see the stack uh, animation with the reconciliation algorithm based on the stack, the old one, and on the uh, uh, the other side. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> Can we get some help? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you'll see the fiber, which is clearly smoother and much better in terms of performance. And if you needed Arthur's directions to understand which is faster, then fiber has a problem. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> and so we've seen some of the uh, cool features or main features of. Uh, React and Angular, but let's see um, how you get started with both frameworks. And so with Angular, uh, you can either uh, start by writing your own configuration, your own code, and just get started um, with your stuff, or you can use Angular CLI, who will basically help you bootstrap your project, will generate all the configuration you need for your build, for your tests, and also it will generate uh, basic ng module and the basic component that will be according to the Angular style guide, right? So, what about React? React has a very similar setup. Basically, available as an npm module, you have the create React app, which is quite similar to what the Angular CLI does, and you can just install it and then. Create React Lab and name your app. And yeah, so getting started with the Angular project is as simple as doing ng new or React from Create React Lab. And so you get started, you have your first component, and yeah, since components are the heart and soul of both frameworks, let's see how a component looks like uh, in each of the frameworks. And in uh, React, in Angular, sorry, I get confused. Uh, in Angular, you can see that a component is basically formed t from two parts. The first one is the metadata of the component, where you basically get to define the HTML tag. And if you have a template, like you can either define the template in line, or you can add the URL, and then you can define style for your component. And then the second part is uh, a TypeScript class, if you're using TypeScript, and this is going to uh, define the behavior of your component. And in React? React uh, setup is very similar, except we kind of mixed it up a little bit. We use uh, so React uses the JSX uh, templating language, which is uh, React specific, uh, and the heart of the component uh, is the render method, where you will see uh, the content that will get uh, transpiled to plain HTML. Uh, you can assign, uh, you can give the class uh, methods that will define the behavior and styles as well, which can be defined both in line or outside the in the external file CSS, just plain CSS, which is kind of recommended. Yeah, and so the, the one of the coolest things that I've noticed when looking at these two components, which are one in Angular, the other one in React, they're doing the same thing, right? They have a input that reacts to a change. If you look at the number of lines of code that you're writing, in Angular you have 22 lines of code, and in React you have 23 lines of code. So what does that mean? Does the framework makes you write more code than the other? Actually, it's quite similar, right? That's maybe, yeah, React, 
basically. So maybe we should have a look at the code. Yeah, that might look clear. that might look interesting, and uh, you can see that like, this is just for the sake of of example. You're not going to do this in a real world application, but in a single file, you can see that we are initializing the Redux store using the create store method, and we're passing as an R, as a parameter a list of reducers, and then in the counter component, we are uh, handling ev events like uh, on increment that we are dispatching. Uh, type uh, action of type increment let's say and that's an incremental value and then this is the actual reducer it's super 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 simple um, our action is just a string and then uh, depending on the the action that's being sent to the reducer we are uh, just changing the state here and so another thing that was very interesting and that's very interesting in angular is that uh, you can easily use an http service that's being implemented it's in the it's built in the framework and so what happens in react like i, I couldn't choose where's my http service so basically react uh, is not a framework i'm just saying that just to be clear um, it's library so but that gives you a lot of flexibility in that you would be able to um, just use some of the basic request libraries that are out there already. So you could use Axios or Fetch if you like promises, or you could use SuperAgent if you like plain old callbacks. So. But you should like callbacks, just so you know. <laughs> and, uh, and then, yeah, this takes me to the other point, which is how do you pass data between components? Because that's an important part in your application. And there's, diff there's different ways of passing data or different behaviors that you want to, uh, to achieve. And one of them is pass data from your parent to your child component. And you can do that easily by just passing the props uh, from parents to, to child, which we've seen earlier. And then another more complicated uh, use case where uh, basically uh, if you were an Angular developer, if you wrote Angular, you might be used to this. Like you want to, your child just to talk to the parent. That's not something that's very usual in React. Right? Oh, basically, uh, in React, if you want to communicate, the only way to do things is one way, and that's from parent to child. So if ch you want, children don't have any opinion, just so yeah, you know. No, completely unopinionated. If you want to do this kind of thing, where you just communicate from the child to the parent, you will want to use a state management library uh, and just use. Uh, pass data through the Redux store. And so, if you want to communicate from one component to another, components that are not, not, not necessarily related, you could still use Redux or MobX, and that's going to help you deal with the more complex state management. And so, after looking into React, coming back to Angular, and seeing all these new concepts, for me at least, uh, I realized that actually Angular has support for uh, Redux as well. And you can use the Redux concepts uh, by uh, just using NGRX. And uh, this is an implementation um, from Angular that's going to use uh, observables and RxJS. And it looks, the code looks very similar to uh, how the code looked like in Angular, so basically in React. So basically you still have like the component where you trigger an event by click and then you are just uh, incrementing, you want to increment the value, and you are dispatching on line 22 uh, action of increment. And then this is going to be matched in this reducer uh, against a certain case there, and it's going to increment our value. So this is super simple, right? And we can use this, we can reuse the same patterns which have been proved in the React ecosystem, and yeah, it's super useful. Very similar. Exactly. And then, um, the stateful versus stateless, after getting my head around, okay, so there's these different types of components and uh, this is how you want to communicate, I realized that I can actually design my Angular project to use the same kind of principles and there's nothing, really absolutely nothing in the framework that prevents you to use uh, smaller components that actually help you test your application much easier. And so we're developers. So we do like really nice tools, so let's talk about some tools then. Yeah. So Angular comes with tools like Angular CLI, which we've seen earlier. And then to write end-to-end -end tests, you're going to use Protractor. And you can also like pick into your 
um, your application's data at runtime using Angular Augury. And Shmuela has a, I think she has a good talk on Angular Augury. I recommend you go watch that one. And then you also have, from Angular, you have language services, which help you um, maybe detect errors in your HTML templates, and uh, you can use IDs like Visual Studio Code, and they will help you maybe do, do something. There's quite a lot of support for, for developers. What about you? So, yeah. yeah, React is extremely flexible when it comes to your dev setup. So basically what you need, probably, if you don't have it built into your system, like mechanically you know everything, then you probably need a linter, which will tell you if your code has any code smells. And the most popular one out there I found was uh, the ESLint config for, from Airbnb. Uh, for an editor, yeah, wide open. You can use whatever you like. I prefer Vim, but I have heard really good things about VS Code, for example. It has really nice plugins for React. And that here it is, it's an opportunity for you and your workmates to actually get to fight about editors, right? You, you can either choose it's Vim always fun. or Emacs or... Do we have any Vim users here? <laughs> okay. Nice and problem. Emacs? <laughs> oh! <laughs> a hero there, a single hero. <laughs> for uh, debugging, uh, so React has really... Uh, nice features in terms of debuggability. Uh, one, there are a couple of tools uh, I would recommend, and one of them is the React Developer Tools, which will show you the uh, browser DOM as uh, React components, and then there's the two Redux dev tools, the normal one and the remote one, uh, which is very similar. It does the same thing as uh, Angular or GUI. Uh, basically, it shows you at runtime uh, what's going on in the state of your application. And basically, that will help you do really cool things like uh, time travel, travel debugging, which is a really nice feature. Have you guys seen the time travel debugging in, in Redux? It's really awesome. Really, really awesome. And there's, of course, uh, coding guides and architecture guides. Uh, <coughs> provided with love by the community, and they're all open source, so. I think that's fantastic. But then, obviously, with everything around us, there's always challenges, right? So, in order to understand the technology, we not only need to know which are the features, and how does it work, and how to write the code, but you also need to understand what's going to be bad in that, in that technology. And with Angular, I guess that most of you <laughs> already know that there's no upgrade path from Angular 1 to Angular 2 or to Angular. And so if you have uh, an existing project that's written in Angular JS, then you're, it's going to be quite difficult to up upgrade to uh, newer versions of Angular. But then there's a few guides out there. So the first thing that, or guidelines on how to write your code, and the first thing is to make sure that you're following the Angular style guide written by John Papa, no one else. <laughs> and um, that's going to help you write code that's kind of uh, easy to migrate. And then um, another thing that you should be doing is basically include TypeScript in your project. I've been working in a um, project that's used Angular JS and TypeScript for like more than two years, and it worked out perfectly. I totally recommend you to do that. And then you can use things like upgrade module and the upgrade cheat sheet if you actually start migrating your project gradually. And there's this blog from Asim where he has this crazy idea that the best migration uh, path is actually putting your Angular JS project in an iframe. <laughs> so <laughs> if that sounds crazy to you too, you should definitely check out his blog. I'm going to share the, the slides uh, after the talk. So what about React? So the biggest challenge uh, in React, uh, like I said, you know, if Angular and React had a fight, I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting, you know, it's a it's a library, not a framework. Again, you know, just stating. So, you know, 
it can prove difficult to architect uh, large applications because you know you need to have a schema of where the state will trans transition and how it will transition. Um, and of course, their state management it's kind of difficult to kind to figure out all the use cases, figure out all the events, and build the flow. And there, of course, uh, there's a recent kind of problem that uh, has just has been spelled out, and that's the patent issue. Uh, the patent issue is that made everyone run away from Facebook technology right now, with uh, especially React. I don't think it's warranted necessarily because uh, basically what it stipulates is that you can't uh, sue Facebook if you invent something based on React technology. So unless you're an inventor, you're kind of off the hook. But yeah, it's it's been like really strange days have legally. You, have you heard about Apache giving up uh, React? Like, uh, yeah, so Apache just basically banned React from any new project. And so Word, and WordPress as well. Uh, Automatic as well have uh, given up on uh, using React for uh, their front end for but, some projects. Yeah, but they're definitely yeah, the kind of inventors, so you have to pick and choose your, your technology based on your needs. And then, yeah. if you get on the block. Yeah, if you're, if you're tired of all this Angular and React and Angular and React and never ending conversation, you can just pick and choose your the new kid on the block, which is Vue.js, uh, and um, this is a project that has the best of both worlds. Um, it's inspired from both React and Angular. But, but we're not saying you do have to choose, you only have to choose if you have specific needs, and if either React or Angular fits your needs, you should choose that. You don't. Don't worry about the performance. It's not going to be a huge difference. Uh, it's just varies. Yeah. And like, if you were wondering how mature are the frameworks? Well, in the grander scheme of things, JavaScript frameworks are uh, starting from five years ago to zero days a few weeks ago to you know with JavaScript frameworks are not mature in the grander scheme of things. So, don't worry about it. But that means that both Angular and React have been kind of battle tested in very large companies, and so Angular is avail like uh, has been implemented in projects at Google and Solar City and Tesla. Who's not a huge fan of Elon Musk and Solar City and Tesla? Doesn't that inspire you? Like, oh yeah, let's use Angular. Or use React, and of course Airbnb uses it. Netflix uses it, and Facebook, of course, uses it. And there are, there are products used by like millions and billions of people, so there, there have been definitely battle tested, and their maturity has been challenged. But the, the main takeaway from this talk is that if this was a competition, which is not, and if we had a winner, which we don't, or maybe we do, the only winner here is actually the, the community and the JavaScript ecosystem. Because as you could see from uh, the examples we had before, both Angular and React are very similar. And you can achieve the needs of your, pro of your product of, or implement any idea, really, with any of the two frameworks. And it works out really well. But the one thing that happened with these two frameworks existing or libraries existing in parallel is that they've been challenging each other. Uh, constantly, and that means that they've created a better ecosystem for us to work in. So basically, the winner is the... It's pretty much all of us uh, working with JavaScript. And the fact that they improved the uh, language so much, and I think we are all winners in this scenario. Yeah, so I hope you enjoyed our talk. Uh, if you want to chat more about uh, React and Angular, come find us at the round table. And um, you give us a sh you can give us a shout out on Twitter as well at Simon underscore Patin and Cool. Thank you.